As soon as you stop focusing on yourself and you start focusing on other people, you can change the world. Episode 74. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, something a little bit different, actually. I'm not speaking to an architect and I'm going to do a little series where every so often I'm going to be speaking to somebody outside of the architectural industry uh, who is being pioneering, innovative, entrepreneurial. They might be in the startup phase. They might be um, senior CEOs of long-running businesses or seasoned entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs. And I'm going to be asking them questions about how they're running their businesses, how they're leading, how they're creating things, how they're innovating. And there's a lot, I think, a lot of richness that we as architects can be learning from seeing how different organizations and businesses operate. And often some of the greatest innovation comes when you look outside your own discipline and see what other industries are doing and actually try and apply or take those kinds of ideas and bring them into your industry. Many, many a marketing success has been created from that very strategy itself. So this week I'm talking with Simon Paulston Jones, who is the CEO of Woken Up, which is a app which is in, it's just gone into its beta stage development. So it's a very new app. Um, it's a global social network um, with a social purpose. So I thought this was very relevant to architects um, because as architects we are always interested in social purpose and the sort of civic responsibility of buildings that's something that's very kind of integral it's in our code of conduct it's part of the complex nature of things that we need to be uh, dealing with and Woken Up's premise is very simple and they bring together in a single purpose-built online platform the people, companies, non-profits and other tech for good platforms taken action on today's pressing social and environmental issues from climate and sustainability to diversity and beyond and their aim really is to sort of significantly accelerate and deepen their impact and it's very much founded upon the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals which sit at the core of the platform and its functionality. So Simon gives me a very um, intimate interview here and he talks about how he's kind of transitioned from a working as a solicitor uh, in the financial uh, sector and how he's moved and gone into being the CEO of a startup social networking platform and the story of that, what he's been through, the risks that he's taken to make that happen and the following and audience that they're developing and the platform that they are creating. It's a really, really fascinating story, rich with lots of business inspiration for you all to enjoy. So sit back and enjoy Simon Paulston Jones. Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure to have you. You're up to some pretty exciting things. You've had an interesting career previously in the financial sector as uh, you're working for, was it Barclays? So yeah, I did a couple of things. I spent uh, about 15 years as a lawyer. I did some of that inside a law firm, yep. uh, Simmons & Simmons, and then after seven years of advising investment banks, I decided to go work for one, which is Barclays, yeah. uh, and was there um, specialising in fairly complex and esoteric financial products, uh, and then left that to go run a trade association representing uh, hundreds of financial institutions, uh, primarily investment banks, but stock exchanges and that sort of thing. So uh, lots of skills I picked up in that world that are now transferable to what we're talking about today. So that, that's really fascinating. So you've had, a, you've had a, a kind of very deep background in the financial services and financial, financial sector. And now what we're talking about today is your new venture yep. called Woken Up, which is an app. Um, and I think this is really fascinating for the business of architecture audience to hear about as you're kind of going through the process of ri- raising funds, um, starting off, you know, developing the technology, developing the user interface, building a community, building a tribe. Um, and it's and also the, it's the kind of the, the purpose behind the business as well, I think, will really resonate with a lot of people. Um, so tell me a little bit about Woken Up. Thank you. So, um, how did it begin? 
Well, as you say, I've spent 20 years uh, working in the financial services and legal sector. So how do you transition from that to tech for good? Um, honestly, it, it started with a date with a beautiful woman a couple of years ago. And um, she said that by day she had historically been a professional opera singer. But in her spare time, she volunteers as a life coach. And I've been through a lot of changes in my life. I've taken uh, a trade association through a merger. Uh, I got divorced earlier in the year before that date. And um, she, Renee, to give her a name, um, said to me, you might want to look into life coaching. Um, so she put me in touch with the organization that she volunteered for. And what I got out of that was that where I haven't succeeded quite so well is where I'm focused on me. Mm. But where I've got the most personal reward is where I've been focusing on helping other people and taking action on the causes that matter to me. And I was um, invited to summarise all of that in a single sentence. And I said, well, my name's Simon and I'm the possibility of giving back and making a difference. I said, well, that's brilliant, Simon. You've done a couple of our courses now. You're on the right track. But there's this third and final course and we'll mentor you for four months whilst you breathe life into that sentence that I'm Simon and I'm all about giving back and making a difference. Mm. Um, and we'll invite you to create a project as part of that course. And it'll breathe life into that sentence, but it can't be about Simon. It's got to be about everyone else in the world. And my immediate reaction was, giving back, making a difference, not about Simon, but about everyone else in the world as a project. I literally don't know where to start with that. I felt completely disempowered. And at that same moment in time, I realized that millions of us around the world want to do something bigger than just ourselves. Mm. We want to find a sense of purpose. I don't know if it's just because uh, more and more people are, no longer have religion as to the as the answer of you know, why am I here? So they want something more concrete. Mm. And if, if things like the climate emergency, if God is not going to save us, then it looks like it's up to us then. So that sense of personal responsibility for making a difference, there was nothing to empower people to drive change on the social and environmental issues that matter to them. Mm. So I decided to go build it. And initially, this was a, a project as part of a life coaching course when I wasn't busy lobbying on behalf of investment banks around the world. And it just grew from there and got traction and people were getting inspired by the vision of the world that we could potentially create together as soon as the next 10 years that uh, it became so compelling. I decided to give up 20 years in the city, <laughs> uh, take a plunge, uh, jump off a cliff and work out how to build an aeroplane on the way down before I hit the bottom. Amazing. I mean, so that's, pretty, that's a pretty bold and courageous step to do that. So what is the app? What is it? How does it work? What, how have you been developing it? What, what have been the sort of the stages from this kind of inspiration moment to where you are now and where are you at with it at the moment? Thank you. So I guess it all starts with what is it that you're trying to achieve? And I realise that I'm looking to empower people to take action on the causes that matter to them, um, not just talking about things, but actually taking action with a particular goal in mind. And through all of that, as I was doing my research, I came across this thing called a responsible business report, which I hadn't seen before, but it's what companies do to show what they're doing to... Uh, have an impact on the causes that matter not only to them but to their customers and to their employees and the talent they want to hire in the public at large and I came across a thing called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals which again I hadn't heard of before but this was essentially a vision that the United Nations painted in 2015 with 17 goals as to how they would like the world to look in the year 2030 so it's beautiful it's time bound and it's 17 different topics if you like ranging from taking action on climate promoting gender equality getting rid of racial inequality and all mm. other sorts of inequality taking action on poverty and hunger but it's not just sort of getting rid of bad things it's also about doing good things so decent work opportunities sustainable cities and so on and i realized here i have this canvas this framework for making sense of what people are doing and I realised that the Responsible Business Report, good though it is, it's really stale in that it's usually printed in hard copy. Yeah. It's typically to be found uh, in the lobby of somewhere you're going for a meeting. And it's typically produced once a year. 
And so the information in there is not particularly accessible and it is stale by the time it's published. And I realize that there's this whole side of companies that isn't getting much airtime. And when you try and find that content, it's very hard to find. So if I want to go and find out what uh, a bank is doing on diversity and sustainability, I might go to their website, but their website design is um, different from all the other websites, so I'm wasting time. And then if I go to LinkedIn, look at their LinkedIn profile, they're so busy telling me what a brilliant bank they are that it's really hard on LinkedIn to answer a really simple question, which mm. is, can you show me all of your posts on sustainability and on diversity? Because I have to just infinitely scroll till I get what I want. As I was setting up this company, I was using Slack a right. lot to communicate with uh, various people that I was working with. And I realized that the beauty of Slack is it creates this topic-led approach. Yeah. And I thought, well, if I can blend the idea of LinkedIn with the usefulness of Slack in having a topic-led approach, suddenly you can instantly enable companies to answer the question, what are your last five posts, or indeed all of your posts, on any given topic that matters to me as your customer, as your employee, as somebody who's thinking about going to work for you, or as someone who's just thinking about you know, the impact of, in that example, banking on society and mm. the environment. So we're building a new global social network to enable you to communicate not just with people in your lobby who are reading your responsible business report and not just shareholders who might read your financial statements, but to connect with the world and most importantly with your customers and potential customers, with your current employees you want to retain and the talent you want to go hire, to empower you to communicate what these days we call your purpose, the, right. the action that you're taking on the social and environmental issues that matter to those customers and employees. So that's what's missing from LinkedIn. I understand what you're selling as a bank, as an architect, uh, as a widget manufacturer. What I don't currently see is the action that you're taking on the causes that matter to me. And I don't see it because we've got all of these disparate platforms online and offline, all these different WhatsApp groups and uh, societies that we might be members of or clubs we might participate in. And it's all very disaggregated. Mm. So the problem that we solve through this social network is disaggregation. And we look to bring together the people, the companies, the nonprofits and the technologies who are together taking action on today's pressing social and environmental issues through the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Because by bringing them together onto a single purpose-built platform, you can accelerate and deepen their impact. It's why we join members clubs, trade associations. It's why we surround ourselves with like-minded people. Yeah. Because that network effect enables us to deepen and accelerate but our impact. It's, it's very interesting as well because you're, you're pointing towards this kind of purpose-led business. Mm -hmm. And not only is that kind of important for the people that are running the businesses themselves, but for a consumer perspective, that actually this is becoming something that's more and more driving our decisions, our consumer behavior, the kinds of businesses that we want to interact with. We are now expecting more of a kind of, we want to be part of their vision and the purpose, mm -hmm. which is benefiting everybody. And this is actually becoming, I think this is, this is really fascinating. And I think for a lot of architects, you know, there's always the want to contribute to the environment, to contribute to the built environment, to contribute to various communities. Um, so bring in awareness or kind of, do you think there's a, there's a sort of a kind of a shift or an evolution of how the kind of capitalist organizations work or there is, there's a kind of conscious capitalism that's kind of emerging? Absolutely. Uh, our platform is called Woken Up for a reason. It's that, if, Colloquially, we say that we've woken up to the climate emergency or we've woken up to how capitalism leaves people behind due to the inequalities that it creates. Um, and having woken up to an issue, then we oftentimes talk about how awful it is. But times are changing and it's really driven by Generation Z who are very socially active, those who are under 25. And they're not happy just talking about what is uh, irritating them or, or what they're dissatisfied with. They want to take action. That's why we've got Greta Thunberg and, and her generation protesting against climate and striking 
from from schools every Friday. That's why we've got Extinction Rebellion and, mm. and so on. So people are now moving from talking to taking action. And this is really driving change in the corporate world so that people now want to buy from and work for and invest in those companies with purpose. And perhaps amazingly, uh, for someone who's worked in the financial services sector for the last 20 years, we're now seeing companies, including the world's largest banks, respond to that. Just two weeks ago, there was a letter that was published by uh, an association in the US called Business Roundtable. This is 181 of corporate America's leading companies from Amazon and Apple and American Express and American Airlines and Boeing and, you know, that's just the A's, A to Z. <laughs> um, and they said, yeah, 20 or so years ago, we wrote a letter and uh, that letter basically said that the obligation of a company is to act in the best interests of its shareholders. Right. To put shareholders above everybody else. Now, we recognise times are changing and we're reissuing the letter. And now we recognise that we have to act in the best interests of all stakeholders. So that's not just shareholders, far from it. It's also about your employees, about the environment as a whole, about your customers, about the uh, your your impact on the environment as you're going about things and creating your products and you know where are you getting the supplies from looking at your supply chain and so on so it's actually a, a sea change and the response to that letter has been uh, mixed partly it's times are really changing this is this is a sign of what's coming in the 2020s and in part there's a bit of healthy scepticism, mm. which is, you know, we've got lots of pacts and um, statements about things that we'll do, but they rarely follow through. Yeah. So the challenge to corporate America, the challenge to all of us that are running companies is to show that we're more than just words and that we're actually taking action on the social and environmental issues that matter to our customers and our colleagues. And Woken Up is designed to be that shop window for purpose-led companies to show the action that they're taking and the impact that they're making on those causes that matter to those stakeholders. And we have specific tools to help them do that that don't exist on other social Yeah, so, so so what are the ways, what are the methods of how companies can communicate that? And does it become more of a sort of, is it a conversation, is it engagement, or is it more of a, a platform for displaying? So uh, it's uh, there are a couple of things you can do with it. So. It's a social network. Yeah. So in the same with all other social networks, it's about posting content. Yes, you can post videos and, and photos to go support what you're doing. Um, unlike anywhere else, you can tag your posts not only by hashtag, but also to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal to which it relates. Right. And because we have a unique UI, UX, the way it looks and the way it works, um, which is topic-led, it means that you can press an individual icon that represents one of the 17 sustainable development goals, let's say sustainable cities. And then you can see all of the posts in your network, or if you flick another button, all the posts across the entire platform that relate to that particular goal. Right. And if that's not granular enough for you, you can do the same with hashtags. So if hashtag sustainability or hashtag diversity was something that you're passionate about, press hashtag sustainability and there's no more infinite scrolling. Yeah. It's just... Here's all, all the posts. It's almost like we present you with a menu and it's, you know, what do you want to eat? What do you want to read about today? Yeah. Rather than, you know, here's all of the food and go figure out what you want. And actually, here's some algorithms that are going to push you what we think you want to eat. Um, we also have something called a snippet, which is a way of communicating in plain English to the public at large, in language they understand, the impact that you're making pursuant to the Sustainable Development Goals. And so to give an example of that, you might say as a single sentence, we have switched our global offices over to water filters and we have saved 34,000 plastic water bottles. Or, uh, and then you would tag that to uh, SDG 6, which relates to clean water. And the uh, app would recognize that SDG 6 has a particular color associated mm. with it and a particular logo that the UN associates with that. So they'd use that color and that logo, attach it to your data point. And then when I'm scrolling through the posts that your organization has put out, I can now see you know, these things will really leap out at you in that they're sort of a, a tweet length of data 
that show me in measurable terms the action that you're taking, but more importantly, the impact that you're making on the causes that matter to your audience. And you know, it could be anything. For, it could be about plastic water bottles. It could be you've reduced your carbon emissions by a third in the last three years, or 27% of our newly promoted partners are women, yeah. or you know, 40% of our US associates are from ethnic minorities, or whatever it might be. It's just simple, short sentences that show that you're having a positive impact. Amazing. So how how did you start this then? I mean, in, in terms of how did you, what were the sort of challenges that you face and actually taking this from an idea, mm. from, a, from a sort of inspiration, a kind of a purpose and a mission, what were the things that you had to do to actually turn it into what it is right now? So it's at the moment, it's, it's, it's in its beta stage? So testing. it will be in beta from the beginning of November right. and it will be globally available can you uh, explain, for everyone. Can you explain what beta means? Yeah, beta, beta simply means that we've built a platform and we want to check that it works properly before we release it out to the world. Right. So we create this community of what they call beta testers, just people who are going to try it out for us, who are not internal to us, they're not staff members, they're people out in the real world, they're companies and non-profits and over 550 individuals who are going to be playing around with it to check it works before we release it publicly. And how long has it taken to get to that stage? So uh, we incorporated uh, the company or the predecessor of the company in March of last year. We'll right. be launching in November of this year. So just over 18 months from initial idea to a global social network that people can play around with. Right. And so and what were the stages? What were the kind of milestone stages in getting yeah. to this point? So you have an idea. Yeah. Uh, and then you want to turn that idea into reality. So... Part of it is trying to work out what are the problems that you're trying to solve and who are you trying to solve them for? Yes. So who are you trying to solve? You've got to start with a problem. And, and the problem <coughs> that we identified was for individuals, I want to make a difference, but I don't know where to start. So you need to show them what the world's doing in taking action. And by seeing what others are doing, seeing their example, you can now see tangibly um, what you could do to take action on the causes that matter to you. And then we realized that charities, by definition, are taking action on the causes that matter to them. Um, so this will have to involve nonprofits somehow. And then I realized the corporate world have this other side of their business, not the stuff that they're selling, but the action they're taking on the causes that matter to their customers and their employees um, that wasn't being communicated. So yeah. that needed to be part of it. And then we realized that all these technology solutions that once you want to take action, you want to find out you know, what can I do about it so partly it's about yes I've got a recycling bin but it's part you know, really about you know what technologies are available to me to uh, improve the particular part of the world that I want to improve so the journey was really working out what's the community so for us it's individuals nonprofits, companies and tech for good platforms yeah what's the problem that you're solving well our, our vision is a world of a billion people by 2030 who are regularly in the habit of helping others and uh, taking action on the social and environmental issues that matter to them. Um, and in order to manifest that, um, you've got to work out what is it we're actually building and what are the problems we're solving. So we realised we need to involve, we're going to involve a billion people. It basically has to be a social network. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's that's the only way. And that's the way that people are used to interacting. So it's a social network that brings together those four groups for what purpose? Taking action on the causes that matter to them. And once you've got that, so now I've got my community, I've got my why, uh, and then, uh, and the why is to, to drive social progress. But I, I need to sort of put that succinctly and think big you know what really inspires people so our mission statement is actually to transform humanity for good right and really moving away from this selfie decade into a we 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 decade in the 2020s that's what we're looking to do mobilize people to stop focusing on themselves and focus on other people because particularly with the climate emergency but not just that we need to mobilize so you need to think what's the problem i'm solving what's the community i'm doing it for how am i going to do it and then now I've worked out it's a social network, what's that going to look like? And how can I build a product that is specifically solving the problems relating to wanting to get inspiration for making a difference? 
wanting to communicate the impact my company is making. And that's where you discover the UN SDGs and realize they have to be a core part of the mm. product in a way that they're not on any other social network because this this core of taking action on social and environmental causes isn't a reason for being for other social networks. And very briefly, our research showed that in 2013, people had four social media accounts. By 2018, they had eight. It's not that the doubling that's interesting. It's that people use each social network for a different purpose. Yeah. What you stick on Snapchat, you wouldn't want on LinkedIn, yeah. or vice versa. So our niche is for people taking action on social and environmental issues. And we can, we can talk about these sort of more granular you know, process issues. But I think once you've solved what the product might be, then you realize you're actually building a business. And yeah. building a business has a whole host of other challenges aside from what's the actual product. And what were those challenges? And well, and, and, how, and how do you, because so, so you've, got, you've got your mission, you've got the, yep. you've got the, you've, you've kind of defined a user problem. Yeah. You're clear on what that is. You're clear on, on a grander vision for what you want to be making a difference in. And now it needs to operate like a business. Yeah. And so this is the th this is the point where many people just either stop. Yep. Or it doesn't happen. So what, how, who was involved? Yep. And what were the, what for you, what have been the components into turning this into a business? So I think first of all, you, you need a really healthy appetite to risk. Right. Um, because it's, starting as one person with an idea that was you know, part of a life coaching course and turning that into the next global tech company um, involves more than just me. So in spite of having been a CEO, a chairman, uh, in spite of being a lawyer for the last 15 years, yeah, I've never been a corporate lawyer. Mm. I've never had to set up a company before. So you're constantly learning Right, so I need to incorporate a company. How do I do that? What does it cost? Um, now I've incorporated it. Now what are my legal obligations as a director of a company? Well, I know what those are. I've got a bit of a head start as a lawyer there. What are all the corporate filings that I've got to do? How do I make sure I don't go to jail because I missed one? I'm going to need someone to help. So now I've got a company and I've incorporated it. Uh, again, not I had to find someone to go do that to make sure I did that right. Then I had to find someone to make sure I met all of my obligations from a sort of co company secretarial perspective. Uh, then I realized that, well, I'm going to need money to go build this. Um, for over a year, I had to entirely self-fund the whole thing. So I put £37,000 of my own money in the company yeah. just to fund the, the building of a prototype. So I had a vision as to what this might look like. I have zero technical or tech expertise. I'm yeah. a lawyer and a lobbyist. I'm yeah. not, uh, as someone put it to me, you're not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm not, you know, not by training, but uh, I'm Simon. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the skill set necessary to design my own uh, social network, my own prototype. So I went for lunch with a friend uh, who uh, was running a, uh, a fintech company. And he said, well, actually, you know what? It sounds quite interesting. I've got a couple of app developers. Uh, I, I could lend you um, yeah, in their free time in the evening to go build your prototype. And so you start with literally a sheet of A4 paper and, get, and start mapping what this looks like yeah. on A4. And then I discovered this thing called Adobe XD uh, software package where you can start mapping it out. And I've always been good at PowerPoint and doing animations in PowerPoint. And some of these software packages, I realized were little more than yeah, a bit more complex than yeah, PowerPoint, if you can do animation. So I ended up working with uh, a wonderful guy to build a prototype. And then no sooner had we finished, I realized that actually, I wanted to take this sort of Slack-like approach to the UI UX. So I had to almost completely reinvent again that prototype after I'd say goodbye to him, but I, he'd given me such a great education in what I needed by way of software development that I could then do that myself. And then it's like, right, well, this is great, but it's basically a social network designed by a lawyer and a lobbyist, um, not anyone who's got the first idea as to how to build an app. So I better go find a professional. Yeah. So then it's, crikey, uh, I better go find a professional app developer. How do you do that? So you get online and you're taking a bit of a, a punt as a non-expert 
that the organization in front of you is the right one for you. And I uh, tried out two or three different uh, app developers before settling on a company called Hyper Apps, who were uh, really excellent. And they then put me in touch with my current app developers, iQantas, who are in uh, Eastern Europe. So now I've got someone building the platform for, for me, having got someone else set up the company for me, um, having got the company going and the platform getting built, I now need a community of people to try out the product. So now I need, well, I need a website to try and catch it. I can't build a website, so I need someone to go build a website. Yeah. Um, I need to uh, find uh, that launch community of non-profits and companies. So I need to be having conversations like this. Um, where the hell am I going to find those people? Um, I became a member of a wonderful club in the middle of town here in London called The Conduit. And really what I'm doing is I'm building The, Conduit, the Conduit as a global I, social I, network. I, in, in, um, in Mayfair. In Mayfair. It brings together high net worth individuals, social entrepreneurs and non-profits yeah, did, for the same reason we do. Did did, did interview there the other week. Actually. Right. It's fantastic. Uh, Beautiful. It is fantastic. It's a, and it's, yeah, it's a socially conscious um, private members club. You've got it. Yeah. So really all I'm doing is I'm scaling up a 3,000 person club into a global social network yeah. that we can all participate in, mostly for free. So, and talking mostly for free, of course, you then need a business model. Yes. If, as a business, it's got to be a sustainable business. So you think about, well, what, how am I going to commercialise what I'm doing? Um, yeah, I'm not interested in every last dollar of profit. I'm first and foremost focused on impact. And by building a company, a purpose-led company that delivers impact, that's how you generate shareholder value. And if you work the other way around, you're going nowhere. Right. As we were saying earlier. So now I need to think about that business model. And then I need to think about, well, what are the assumptions on which this model is based? How many users do I think I'm going to get in a certain time frame? Why? How many of those users do I think are going to be companies? If social media advertising is part of our business model, what's the average across the industry for revenue for social media advertising? Or if that's the average, what percentage of that average do I think I can realistically expect? Mm. Will people want to advertise on a platform where there aren't a million users already? Maybe not. So how quickly do I think I can get to a million users and why? So it's research, 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 research about the industry, about the assumptions that you're building. And then when you get to building, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and it certainly wasn't built by one person. Yeah. So now I'm at the stage after 18 months of um, building out my team, yeah. both at board level and at staff level. Um, and I'm coming across a challenge. And that challenge is that I raised money earlier in the summer, but that's not going to be enough to build the team that I need and to tick all the boxes uh, to, to maximize the opportunity here. So fundraising is another core part of uh, running a business. I've never had to raise money before. I've been a CEO and I've had a finance function. Uh, I've had people as you know, running a trade association that dealt with membership as a membership department, and they deal with that. But actually, you know, the, the core part of starting a business is you are everybody from the CEO, the CFO, the chief marketing officer, the T-boy, mm. um, the data entry clerk, the lawyer. Um, you're doing everything. And oftentimes you're doing this on top of your day job because you, you've not yet had the confidence to take the leap. Yeah, so but you've still got bills to pay. You've still got it? bills to pay, exactly. Yeah. So that's been a challenge for me is since I left my uh, role as a lobbyist at the end of January, here we are uh, in early September, I've been entirely unpaid until last night. Uh, <laughs> and I'm used to uh, being paid a very healthy six-figure salary yeah. and my current salary is £18,000. <laughs> so um, yeah, making that work uh, for me, my family, and my family includes my ex-wife and, and two kids from a previous relationship as well as the six-week-old son that I now have, uh, yeah, there's um, a lot of financial obligations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm 43 and I'm living in this wonderful home, but it's rented. And so the bank balance is dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. So um, you need a compelling vision uh, if you're going to jump. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of like strong mindset as well in here. Like there, the, the vision and the... There, there is. I think you need to be absolutely passionate about what it is that you're doing. 
And it's very well to have a passion and think that you've got the world's next great idea, but mm. that then needs to be validated. And that's where going out, hitting the road and talking to people is uh, really incredibly useful. And in an ideal world, you take um, what they call a sort of lean startup uh, model of things where you start with this minimum viable product, the smallest thing it can possibly be, and then test it in the real world and then learn from um, the feedback that you're getting, see how users are actually using your product and then iterate the product and then do another test and another test and another test and slowly grow, grow, grow and iterate and so on. And that's actually easier said than done. Um, so there are lots and lots and lots of things and fundraising is perhaps the hardest thing yeah. um, because if you're building a business, you're going to need capital. And with, uh, in our case, we thought, well, we'll go down the crowdfunding route and we'll look to raise a quarter of a million pounds. So we went on to one of the UK's leading uh, crowdfunding sites. We shot a video like this and I had no experience of videography. So now I've got to go find a videographer. And I've got to come up with a script and then I've got to come up with a story. And then we need the prototype and how do you video the prototype and et cetera. But anyway, you get there. You create a video. And then it's, we're live. We're launched. We've got X number of weeks to go raise a quarter of a million pounds. Here it is. You put it all on your social media. You phone all your friends. You phone anyone you've worked with in the last 20 years. And you say, I'm raising money for this brilliant thing. And then it starts off with a great start because in this case, you, you have to have at least 20% of the amount you want to raise already committed from right. investors. So, you know, phoning around friends and family, particularly uh, professional contacts in my case. And you launch with a bang. And uh, then no one else comes. Then, Christ. And then you've got this graph that shows you how much you want to raise, where you are at the moment, and where you need to be on a sort of straight line basis if you want to hit your target by the end date. And you suddenly cross over that line, and then, God, it's awful. And then you go, you go back, you're like, oh, no, <laughs> something's happening. Yeah, something's happening. And then it goes back. And then it flatlines. And you're like, God, this isn't going to happen. I've, I've jacked in 20 years in the city. Yeah, I, I, a very high profile, uh, fascinating job, mm. extremely well paid job. And I can't even raise a quarter of a million quid. What the hell have I done? And then you get to the end and you realise you've got £140,000 that's been committed. You've got a business plan that says I need two hundred and fifty. So it's very tempting to um, uh, say I failed. Yeah. And to go, you know what, I'm actually, I was a bit of an idiot. Yeah, what was I thinking? Yeah, I'm a lawyer and a lobbyist. I'm not bloody Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you can see I'm getting a little bit emotional as I recount the story. Um, and it's easy to think, gosh, I, I've just thrown everything away. Mm. And then you put yourself together and you realise that you still have the same passion and the same vision that you had before. And that there are any number of reasons why you didn't raise the money that you're after. And then most importantly, you realize that the goal was not to raise a quarter of a million pounds. The goal was to build this platform and yeah. get it out there. And maybe the world will love it and it will become the next Instagram. And maybe the world will just shrug its shoulders. But I said to myself, if I do one thing before I die, I want to find out. Is this what I believe it is, which is truly humanity transforming technology by empowering others to go build the world that they want by 2030? Or, or is it just a dumb idea? I want to find out. So I hit the phones. I had the names of everyone who uh, had committed money. Most of them were people that I'd worked with over the last 20 years. I said, look, I'd like to press ahead anyway. And I'll, I'll revise the budget. Yeah. We'll shrink things. We'll not do things. Are you in? And one by one. So, yeah. You know, this is, Simon, this is never about a platform. This is about you. This is an investment mm. in you. And yeah, one of those investors is investing £30,000 mm. as a single investment in me for what at that time was an idea. And that's one of the lessons I've learned from crowdfunding is if you've only got an idea and it's not been validated and it's not been built, Crowdfunding is probably too early for you, right? If I if I give one lesson, 
Um, which means you've got to do it the hard way, which is raising money from people you know, what they call a friends and family round. Yeah. Um, and only use crowdfunding once you've got something yeah. uh, with data that shows you've got traction and that people can use and try out. So one by one, we got £141,000. Great. Amazing. Now I've got the money I need to go build and launch the platform. And then you realise as you go through that, that yes, but how am I going to moderate content on the platform? Oh, it's a company that does that. Yeah, but that's £5,000 that is in the budget. Um, how am I going to market this? Well, I, I do it this way, this way, this way, this way. It's like, yes, but wouldn't it be great if you could do it this way? Because there's an amazing company that can help you on your social media advertising. Yes, but again, that's not in my budget. And it's constantly, how can I do the most with what I have? Now, uh, just finally, if, if I come from a place where I focus on what I don't have and my very finite resources I say well I'm not doing this because I just don't have the money then I'm never going to have the money and uh, this thing will never happen yeah so I have to have a belief in what I'm doing and I have to believe that if I make a sufficient investment in what I'm doing and if I'm sufficiently organized that a bit like just-in-time production with manufacturing a Japanese car um, I will get what I need just in time to not go bankrupt or <laughs> from a corporate perspective or indeed a personal perspective you know and, and that things will come into place and I'm finding every day mm. that yeah, a week ago I thought God, I really need this and next week someone picks up the phone to me and there it is so um, I, I had at the life coaching course we were talking about earlier, uh, a guy at the end of the course uh, talk about the course. And I don't remember what he said, but I do remember the coffee mug that he was holding at the time. And he didn't mention it at all, but it was this coffee mug. And it says, proceed as if success is inevitable. And, and that is very much how I have conducted myself for the last 18 months, is just to have belief in myself yeah yeah we're all taught by uh yeah, what the world tells us we can and can't do what we're capable of what the world has told us up to today we are i'm a lawyer and a lobbyist i'm not mark zuckerberg mm. right sure but if you change your mindset and this is where the life coaching came so invaluable if you change your mindset instead of being pushed by everything that the past tells you you are and are not and instead Create this possibility of how your life, how the world might be, or in your mind, will be in future. And instead of spending every day being pushed by the past, telling you what you are and are not, and all the failures that come with that, be pulled every single day towards a compelling possibility that you've created. That is utterly transformative of your approach to life what you get done, how you're able to just communicate with people. Because I'm no longer coming from a place of, I'm a lawyer and a lobbyist, I'm not a technologist. I'm coming from a place of, if we can come together on a single purpose-built platform, we can end poverty. We can end hunger. We can have gender equality. We can address the climate emergency by coming together and collaborating and taking action and moving on from this generation's me, 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 and instead making the 20s about we, we, we. And we can do all of this in 10 years. The life coaching taught me how quickly things can change. Mm. I went in on a Friday, and by the time I went out the following Wednesday, I was a different person. People think it takes time to create change. It doesn't. It takes a change of mindset and it takes one word, action. And if you can inspire people to change their mindset, get beyond this sense of overwhelm that we're all currently experiencing from the climate emergency, if we want to call it that, um, and actually look at the, hang on, times are changing. The corporate world is waking up to the fact that they need to be part of their solution. Generations that are coming of age, they're entering the workforce. They're becoming the largest generation of consumers next year. They're voting with their feet and with their wallets. Times are changing so that we're moving on from this me, me, me to bloody hell, this isn't the world that I want. 2019 is not what I want. But there's this vision 
beautifully put out through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of what the world could be, what they have as a target for the world to be in 2030. So we can come together, collaborate, inspire one another, support one another, take a can-do approach as we move all the obstacles out of the way between the world we want in 2030 and today and take action rather than just be pushed by, oh God, it's all bloody awful. Yeah. And what difference do I make? I'm just one individual or we're in the UK. Isn't China and America and India the problem? Um, if we can just move beyond all of that to, no, look, if we're all taking action individually, yeah, we're a drop together. We're an ocean as the uh, Japanese poet puts it. So yes, individually we feel small and separate and alone and inconsequential. But there's a reason that Greta Thunberg's book is called No One Is Too Small To Make A Difference. Because mm. a 16 year old with Asperger's shows that no one is too small to make a difference. And if she can do it, we can all bloody well do it. Amazing. I think that's, a, I think that's the perfect point to, to end there. That's really, really very, very inspiring. And really, thank you so much for, I'm really glad that you've shared the whole ins and outs of what you've, what you've gone through, how, what it takes. And also this kind of resounding message of the importance of purpose. Um, and that when, we, when we're connected to that, that this is when sort of magnificent things start to happen, when we're able to take on the huge risks, we're able to have a stomach for doing these things. Every, every business has, has this process in it of the, you know, the person with the genesis of the idea believes in it, goes through it, and then we'll have to deal with the ups and downs of finance, making it work, enrolling people to be part of the team. And it all comes back down to this vision and a mission and a purpose. And once that's in place, what I'm hearing from you is that that is something that can pull people together and can make massive difference. As soon as you stop focusing on yourself and you start focusing on other people, you can change your world. Amazing. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.